So uh, Michelle asked me to talk about, um, well, I wrote this book, okay? Uh, you know, everyone else during COVID was writing papers about COVID and we were all stuck at home and we were all sick of watching Netflix too much. And so, so actually I, I had started, it turned out I had started a book and, um, and I had sent it off to the publisher. And so basically um, what, I did, did, what I did during COVID when I was stuck at home was actually finish writing, writing the book. And it's, it's called The Economist Craft and um, an Introduction to publishing, Research, Publishing, and Professional Development. It will be actually published in, it'll be, it'll be available November 16th. And my publishers was going to try and have some available for this conference, but we did not succeed. So I was hoping to at least have one copy to show you, but, but uh, I do not have a copy yet myself. But, but anyway, this is the book I've written. And it's, I, I mean, the idea of the book well, the idea is the book is that um, I was at literally talking to one of you beforehand, and and you know, and it's sort of lots of things about how to kind of succeed in our profession, and is sort of passed down by word of mouth, and you should do this, and you should do this, you should not, and and it's sort of it's always it seemed it always seemed to me to be very, I don't know, haphazard in the way things are done. So if you had an advisor who told you something, that's good. If you didn't have an advisor who told you these things, then you sort of had to figure it out yourself and you go online and you, it sort of just seemed very, not very efficient. And, and, and so I decided I would sort of write down kind of the things that you, uh, you would know. And I had a very good editor who told me to call it the economist craft. And, um, and the idea is that what we learn and is really about economics, but we're, we're all economists is sort of, we call the science of economics. So that's what we learn in our class. That's what we learn in every other session in this conference and every other conference is, you know, just I, I wrote how to solve models, estimate equations and study literature and all the stuff we do. And it's, I, I would say it's mostly fairly well taught in most PhD programs, some better than others, of course. Uh, what's not taught and it's equally important is, is to actually how, what they call the craft of economics. There's, how to do research, how to select topics, write up results, manage careers, and there's a there's a million there's a million things that would sort of come into that uh, that thing. So it's taught somewhat haphazardly, uh, mostly through word of mouth, some advisors, friends, and so what what I do in the book is I talk about kind of all of the, try and talk about all of those things, um, and um, and so just I started when when I was typing this, I literally started typing. Uh, bullet points, and I could have gone on for three slides, but, you know, how to pick research topics, how to structure research portfolios, how to find co-authors, how to write readable and interesting prose in English, um, and uh, how to report and interpret empirical work, uh, you know, which, which results do you report, which, how do you interpret it, uh, how do you present results to an audience, um, knowing when and how to cite other, other co-authors. One of my favorite complaints of many doctoral students is they think they have to put 25 pages at the beginning of every paper studying every paper that's ever been written if your if your paper's on bonds that mentions the word bond or something and then and that makes you which of course makes your paper uh, impossible to read itself um, how to be a productive doctoral student how to the reverse how do you advise doctoral students um, the publication process right again um, literally uh, you know three minutes before you guys uh, started Michelle and I were uh, gossiping about the publication because that's what academics do. Basically, if you go in a random cocktail party full of professors, it doesn't matter what field, they will complain about the publication process. So, uh, and the job market, which is sort of so many of you are, are dealing with right now. And, and I think, I, another thing I think is important is, which I'm going to talk about today, is to how you invest in the human capital that will allow you yourself to kind of succeed, but also to enjoy your jobs and not, and not just while you're, you know, 28 and looking for a job, but, but sort of throughout your career. Um, and so those are sort of various, and I, I, I tried to write the book in, in, in uh, it's sort of split up into various self-contained chapters. And when Michelle uh, asked me to talk about this, um, I kind of thought about which chapter to talk, to, to talk about. And uh, you know, I, since I figured that some of you are doctoral students and some of you are professors already, I, I kind of tried to talk about stuff that would be kind of relevant to everybody. And so I, I talked about the last chapter of the book, uh, which is about managing uh, a career. And one thing I will say that actually many, I, 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 uh, 
one of my reviewers was John Cochran, and he convinced me to post it online, the early version, sort of the idea of the working paper model that it would get. And that was a, such a good, good suggestion. Um, and, and actually, several of you have mentioned that you've read the version that was online. And all I would say is that the version now is, of course, I think is much better. But but the, the chapter that I'm going to talk about today was, not, was, of course, the last chapter of the book. So it wasn't written in the version that I posted. And uh, and the publisher's OK with you posting it online for uh, most for a while. But then, you know, a few months before the publication process, they tell you to take it down. And so I did. Um, but uh, but but, you know, how do you so the topic of today is sort of how to manage an academic career. And um, I always think that in business schools like we have tons of counselors designed to help our MBA students and our undergraduates manage their careers. But one thing we ever we never do is to think about how to manage our own careers. And, you know, if you're lucky to get good advice, then you're, you're fortunate, right? Um, and so the, today's discussion is the issues in career management. And so uh, what I'll try and talk about is sort of general principles that will apply throughout your career, uh, both as, you know, when you're starting a doctoral program and when you're a, a full professor and you're bored with life and trying to figure out what to do. And so, uh, and so I talk, I'll talk about developing capital as a doctoral student. Um, the rookie job market, which a number of you are sort of in the middle of right now. Um, uh, life as a junior faculty member, uh, uh, the season market, uh, how promotions work at universities, and how to keep things interesting after you actually do get promoted. So uh, that's a lot of stuff, and I have no idea how long it will take. Um, I, I've never, I actually did a dry run with some of the OSU doctoral students uh, the other day, uh, but you know, so please, but um, but please do interrupt me. I, I'm sort of, I always think it's weird when I talk and don't get interrupted because I'm so used to uh, used to it. But but you know, if you want to wait, I can I, I could do questions at the end as well. So um, so you know, how do you think about? academic uh, career management. One of the things I would say is that one of the reasons why I think probably most of you decided to, you know, become academics is, uh, is, is a lot of freedom, right? I mean, you decide what topics we research. Some of you are interested in, you know, the, sub, the stuff that I, that I do, corporate finance and corporate governance, which is sort of what Michelle, Michelle does, but th there's many of you who are not, right? Many of you are are into asset pricing and there's, there's many different subfields and derivative pricing and, you know, but the point is it's our choice and it, you pick what, what you want to do research on. Um, no matter how much professors complain, uh, the teaching loads are actually fairly low at most of the universities. Uh, we have lots of, you know, we teach a couple classes and after you've done them a few times, you kind of know how to do it. Uh, and, you know, basically uh, of all the possible careers you could pick, our careers are what you make of them, right? It's, you know, we, we have the discretion to do lots of different things. We can get involved with the FMA, we can write textbooks, we can do, you name it, we can do it, right? Uh, some people do a lot of consulting, some people uh, like to advise students, some people become deans. There's, there's many ways your careers can, can project. And so what I think it, you should do is to think about that throughout your career and what, where you want to go. Um, and, uh, and so I think that managing an academic career is, is decision making under rat, what, what, uh, radical uncertainty. And this is a term you may or may not have heard before. Um, one of my um, favorite professors of all time was when I was a student was a guy named Mervyn King, who subsequently became very famous in England because he was a, the head of the Bank of England during the financial crisis. And so he, uh, he became a little bit of a celebrity in England because he was, uh, but he, he just wrote a, a book where he talks about you know, rat, what he calls radical uncertainty, which might be called Knightian uncertainty, which basically what it means is um, the kind of uncertainty that can't be had, so really can't be modeled, right? And if you think about the uncertainties that face, that you will face and all of us will face as we go through our careers, is uh, what's relevant, I, I, so, okay, your interests, right? I mean, the truth is that um, many of you guys mostly are pretty young. Uh, you know, you're starting your careers, either you got your first job or you're looking for your first job. And, you know, and, you know, in 20 years, will you be interested in finance research? And I would claim that the truth is you don't know, right? I mean, you don't really know. I mean, your people's interests change. Sometimes people are totally into finance research when they're 30, and by the time they're 50, they can't stand it and they want to find something else. You know, and sometimes people get, I actually got more interested in finance research as I, as I, as I age, which makes me a little bit weird, but most people, uh, but some people, some people do. Uh, the, the development of the field, the, the field becomes, uh, you know, 
the field changes. I mean, there's basically um, the way I think about many technological uh, things is that you know technology advances in kind of uncertain ways, and and we we are basically doing a technology. We are doing finance research, and what you learn as a graduate student may or may not be relevant uh, 20 years from now, right? So, and that will affect you know your ability as a researcher, and, and I mean basically lots of stuff that um, that you you don't really have control over. Um, the economy, I mean, is is what you're studying relevant or more relevant or less relevant, right? I mean, um, you know, the financial market, one of the really cool things about being in finance is that there's always something new going on in, in financial markets, right? And um, and it's really nice if you actually be know something about what, what what's going on, right? Um, uh, another thing is the development of academia. Um, one of the things that I have been fortunate on throughout my career is that finance has been a kind of a growing field, right? And um, at Ohio State, you can't believe how many undergrads want to take finance. And so we are, uh, Bernadette Minton, our, our department chair, I always say she, she sort of staffs our courses with smoke and mirrors. I have no idea how she does it, but we have like that, literally 3,500 finance majors. And so, and then it just keeps growing. And so fortunately we are looking for faculty this year, but you know, it, no matter how many faculty we hire, there will still be excess demand from our from our students, and we have sixty thousand undergrads, sixty thousand students at Ohio. So we're, we're we're even by the standards of giant universities, we're a giant university. And so so I mean, but but the demand is is high. It's been growing, but who knows what people will demand in fine, you know in, in twenty in twenty years. And and you know, and the other thing is demand for uh, outside of academia. One of the nice things about uh, finance professors is that um, I mean, in certain subfields, there's a huge demand for um, for our services outside academia, you know, I mean, um, if you know how to generate alpha, you, you know, you can earn a lot more money uh, from from the private sector than you can from from a professor as being a professor. Uh, you know, that's your choice if you want to do that. Um, but um, but yeah, again, all these things are un un aspects of uncertainty that will affect your career that you have absolutely no control over, right? So so the question is, uh, what do you do? Uh, the, the book, the term is from a, a recent book by Mervyn, Mervyn King and a guy named John Kay. Um, and how do you deal with radical uncertainty in your, your professional life? Well, well, one thing is you got to work hard on your current projects, but also think about the future. In other words, think about, uh, you know, what, where do you want your career to go, right? I mean, if uh, somebody says to you, would you like to be the associate dean in charge of the undergraduate program in 10 years? I would cringe, and Michelle is shaking her head no, but there's probably some people that say, hmm, that'd be kind of a fun thing to do when I kind of get bored with my research, right? And so think about what you want to do with your, your career. Um, and the, the, so the, basically the two principles are you always want to don't be so into your own current day to forget about thinking about where you want your career to go, but also you, you don't expect that things to happen magically, right? So some people think that, you know, once I get tenure, I will start consulting. Well, I mean, sometimes the phone rings and sometimes the phone, the phone doesn't ring, but unless you develop the connections and the capital to do consulting, then your phone won't ring very much. And so, so you know, you have to think about which way you want your career to do, but, but also kind of actively, um, pursue human capital. Like I have a former uh, colleague who really, really, really wanted to be a business school dean. And so he got himself a job as a department head in a big department. And then eventually he became a, a business school dean. But if he hadn't taken the step of actively, you know, developing a human capital for administration, he would never have, um, his career would not have gone that way. Um, and so, uh, and so you know, what I'll try and do is if you think about these as general principles uh, to, uh, to discuss it at uh, each stage of your academic career. Uh, and so that's what I'll talk about. So anyway, so we have actually a family expression um, that my father came up with, uh, you are the CEO of your life. And so we actually have, this is, a, this is a, we have a house in Northern Michigan that um, my students hear about all the time. And so this is, a, this is actually on the, uh, from the wall from my house. And so I got my daughter to take a picture that I could post it. So, so it's a, you're the CEO. So think about that. You, you always got to remember you're the CEO of your own life and it's not, you shouldn't blame the other people for what happens to you because you, you especially, and this is true in any field, but especially in academia. I mean, you, you, you should pick topics that are interesting to you and, and also interesting to the world and, um, and take, take control of it. Um, 
and so okay so so let me just uh begin um uh, so first of all doctoral student okay um now i have a whole chapter on being uh, being a doctoral student chapter 12 of the book um i'll mention a few points here that are relevant to the rest of the talk um, um okay first of all your dissertation remember it is your dissertation okay it is not um it is not uh your, your advisor's dissertation okay and you know, and sometimes I actually, I, I, I'm a lot, one of the rules about being an advisor is, is, you're, is like being a parent. You're allowed to embarrass your students. So Hank here is my, uh, is my student. And by the way, she's on the market this year and she's very good. And she's got a good friend who's also on the market. Uh, and, uh, and so, so I'm, I'm not supposed to walk too close up because I, that's why I have my mask off. So, uh, so anyway, so, so yeah, so she's, she's doing a topic related to my work on private equity, but, but some, some other students I've worked with that have been very successful have worked on topics that are completely unrelated to anything I've done, but that doesn't mean I didn't enjoy advising them. And I, I think they think I did a decent job advising them. They, they've done very well. You know, I have one student got to work on insurance and one student work on a, a mortgage, you know, you know the, the derivative securities that, uh, and so all kinds of things that I didn't know anything about until I advised them. And it was really fun to, to work with them. So, so when you're thinking of a topic, you remember, work on what you want to work on. Don't work on uh, an extension of your advisor's, advisor's work, okay? It'll come out better, it'll be more fun, you know. Uh, you know, and remember, you, there's a reason why you entered, I, you know, I don't know all of you, but there's a reason why you entered your PhD programs. And presumably, I would hope it's because you were fascinated with financial markets. Because if you were fascinated with financial markets, Go find something else to do with your life. There's lots of you're all smart. You can lots of stuff you can do. So 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 work with, on what fascinates you. Okay. And uh, okay. So uh, okay. So now labor economists talk about different kinds of human capital. Okay. And so when I think of that's applicable to this discussion here because what you do when you're a student and write a dissertation is you develop extremely specialized. Uh, capital in the area that you work on. So, um, so, you know, you have to know your literature like the back of your hand, right? I mean, it just drives me crazy when I meet a student and I said, well, what about such and such a paper? And, 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 and it's obviously a paper that's relevant to their work and they have no idea about it, right? I mean, you have to know your area and you have to know the institutional facts. You have to know everything about your topic, right? When you go into interview with uh, schools, you know, it better be the case that you know your topic way better than anyone who's interviewing. Right. And so, uh, so, I mean, unless you're doing IPOs and Jay Ritter's interviewing or something, but you still have to know every paper Jay's ever written, right? Oh, Jay's here. I'm not in this room, but he's at the conference giving another talk. So, okay. So, um, but you know, uh, and you develop a lot of capital that's specialized in, you know, and that, not just the details of your own papers, but if there's a, an econometric technique that everyone in this literature uses, then you kind of have to know it like really well. Okay. Uh, but on the other hand, um, you, it's also important to develop general human capital as a, as a doctoral student. So, so now at some point, you will want to do something other than your dissertation and the extensions of it, right? The idea is you'll publish your dissertation or you hopefully will publish your dissertation. You'll, but you, there's this thing called diminishing returns in economics. So eventually, when you wrote the fourth extension of your dissertation, uh, you, know, you realize it's maybe not quite as novel as your first the try of the dissertation. And so therefore, you know, you want to, um, you know, do new things and you want to have the skills as a doctoral, that, that, that you learned as a doctoral student that will allow you to do those new things. Because um, one of the things that doctoral students often think is that they are busy, when in fact they don't know what, what life is as busy because, uh, you know, you, you know, there's just so many things that professors do that, that, you know, don't relate to research, you know, running the FMA uh, doctoral program, right? I mean, that's a, that's, that's a, a lot of work. And so the, the idea that you can acquire, you know, skills to do, you know, new econometric, it, it's a lot harder when you're a professor. So you're better off acquiring general human capital uh, when you're a student. Um, you can be a better colleague. You can under, you know, you really want, when, you, when we interview people for jobs, we want to, to know, I mean, like if we're, if we're hiring in capital markets, 
we still want the person we're hiring to you know understand the basics of corporate finance because we want them to be good colleagues in um, in, in our department and vice versa. If we're hiring somebody in corporate finance if they don't know uh, you know the basic issues in capital markets, then we probably don't want to hire them. And um, and so you know and, and the, the other thing is that private sector jobs, which is always a, an option, which we'll talk about soon, they care more about your skills than your papers, right? They basically don't care at all if you publish your papers in the JF or the JFE. They want people who will help them make money in their business, right? Which is what they're supposed to want, right? And so they care about your skills, and if you have the right set of skills, then that makes them very makes you very attractive to them. Um, and so, so the same principles, uh, you, you know, you want to think about future opportunities and develop the capital to pursue them. Um, and so when you're a doctoral student, you know, I mean, how do you go about acquiring when you're, when you're frantically writing your dissertation? Um, you know, you, you learn, learn fields other than your specialty, you know, and most programs require you to learn all the different fields, um, which is a good thing. Um, and you want to, you know, think about theoretical modeling skills, even if you're doing an empirical paper, uh, econometrics, institutional background. Um, another thing that uh, that you have to do is if you're an international student, and I, I, I look around and I see probably a few of you are, are Americans, but probably the majority of people in this room are, did not grow up in this country. And, and one of the things that is true is that, well, life isn't fair, okay? And it's not fair because when, when I was a, um, when I was a baby and when Michelle was a baby, our parents taught us to uh, speak English, okay? When, when Hake and byung Wook were babies, their, their parents taught them to speak Korean, okay? Now, the fact is I do not have to learn Korean and write papers in Korean, but they have to learn English and write papers in English, which is totally unfair. Uh, and, and the world isn't, a, a, you know, and that's just something you have to do. But you have to realize that the standard for written English in, uh, in academia is that basically they should a reader if it's a blind if you know if they see your name obviously they can tell where you're from most of the time but if they if it's a blind thing they don't see your name they should not be able to tell that this is not written by a native speaker okay and so in other words it's not just that the english is correct but there's a lot of usage things that native speakers will you know you, you know you might learn when you learn english as a, as a second language that this is a correct way of speaking but if you ask michelle she would never actually say things that way because that's just not the way americans say things and and so you have to be sufficiently good at it that you will kind of which is a very 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 high standard and and again it's not fair but it's just the way it is um and the other thing is that writing skills and presentation skills are incredibly important both inside and outside academia. So, so when you think about um, one of the things that I like to do with, with, with the students I work with is we, we sort of meet every week and I make one of them present and talk about their work. And part of it is to talk about the work, but part of it is just to get, get them used to being comfortable talking in, about their stuff in front of a, in front of a group because of, you know presentation skills are, and that's one of the reasons why we at OSU and I think at most, but we encourage our students, we sort of require them to teach because we want, not just because, we want them to learn how to teach, but just to be uncomfortable in front of a room talking to people, which is not so easy, especially if it's not in your first language. And you know, um, so uh, so anyway, these are the kinds of skills you want to acquire when you're a doctoral student. Um, another thing is that in the in the last say 30 years, um, and this is true in economics and finance, there's been a huge shift towards empirical work. For, from theory. So in other words, if you were at the FMA 35 years ago, probably at least half of the dissertations would have been theoretical and modeling and stuff like that. Whereas today, I would say probably 90% of them will involve empirical work on one side. And it's just the way the, the journals have shifted the same way. Um, and there's a bunch of reasons why that, right? There's more and better data. Uh, you know, the computing speeds are dr dramatically uh, Bit higher. Uh, there's a diminishing return to theory. We know the, the Modigliani-Miller theorem, and um, and when Modigliani and Miller did it, they didn't know that. You know, so there's a so there's a diminishing returns to, to theory, and and so the, I think that's been a shift in the profession, and um, and I think it's definitely going to con continue, right? So that um, and so as a PhD student, you know, even if you do the theoretical dissertation. I think you'd be nuts to not acquire first-rate empirical skills. And, and I think it goes beyond 
you know, the tradition, the econometrics that, that we used to learn in our classes, right? Machine learning, textual analysis, Bayesian econometrics, and structural modeling are all kind of, uh, maybe the last 20 years ago were considered, you know, really advanced topics that most students didn't know. Now I think it's, when you come out of grad school, you kind of should know this stuff, right? Because the sad fact is that 10 years from now, when you're a professor and, you know, and, and you're a tenured professor, and then there'll be new things that the new PhD students will be knowing that you don't know that go well beyond kind of what, what's the state of the art today. And so you always, there's always a battle to try and keep up to date. And so you might as well start when you leave grad school being really up to date uh, on, on these kinds of things. And, and, uh, and I'm not, again, I'm not an econometrician but I've managed to incorporate a, a bunch of these things in some of my papers because I've had, as, as Michelle pointed out, I have many co-authors and, and I've been very fortunate that some of them are really good at this stuff. So, uh, okay, so the, 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 the next topic, uh, which is your favorite topic of many of you right now, because many of you are on the market, uh, the rookie job market, okay? It's one of the memorable and it's stressful, okay? Don't, it's not, I mean, it, if you think it's stressful and you're complaining to your significant other that it's stressful, that means you're normal, okay? Because it's stressful for everyone, okay? And if it's not stressful for you, then I'd say something's wrong and you're, you're a bit weird because it's stressful for everyone. You don't know. We don't know who's, which schools are looking. You don't know if they're looking for you. You don't know if, if your advisor likes the person at the school or they like your, you know, you, there's a million things that are totally beyond your control. Though it's stressful. At, at the end, most everyone gets a good job. Um, and I would say that one of the things that doctoral programs do is that we all do a pretty good job of uh, preparing students for the market. Um, one of the things that is actually true is that there's been any number of people that have actually posted guides to the rookie market online um, in a footnote in the book somewhere. I actually provide links to uh, maybe eight or nine of them. Um, and so... And I think the links mostly still work. The problem with posting links is that, you know, a year later they stop working in the book. Is it? But, but, uh, but I mean, I certainly think that uh, there's plenty of resources for the market. So I won't repeat much, much of what you've already heard. Uh, let me give you my favorite tips um, with, for the market so that, you know, it's important to be, have a good relationship with your advisor and be uh, open with him or her. And if you don't feel like you can, you can be open with your advisor, um, then you probably have the wrong advisor, okay? Uh, and because, you know, and that, you know you, you, there's going to be personal stuff that you have to, that, that's relevant, right? You know, you may not want your sexual orientation to be known by the market. You may not want to know this or that to be known to the market. You may not want the market to know what your spouse does for a living. And quite frankly, it's not legal to ask those questions in interviews. Of course, my students always say, well, what do I do when they do ask anyway? And I always say to be honest and there's nothing you can do because if they ask and you say, you say that I don't really think I should answer that question, your interview is not going to go particularly well. Uh, I mean, that being said, it really works better if you can discuss these issues with your advisor and keep it all confidential. And so, uh, and so often advisors can put things in, 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 uh, in perspective and find out and talk to people at the other schools and, and work okay deadlines matter okay and it, it's very frustrating because many things in academia deadlines don't matter and when they say it's got to be in by monday if it gets in by wednesday that's good enough but on job market deadlines matter okay because what happens is the school will set a deadline and then the committee will meet two days after the deadline and if you're packet is not there, they will not look at your packet no matter how good it is, okay? So if they do not look at your packet and it doesn't matter if you're brilliant and the papers are great, if they do not look at your packet, they will not invite you to be, have an interview. So, so get things in on time. Actually, we talked about getting things in two weeks before the deadline, okay? And one of the things that, oh, another thing about deadlines is that it went with the computer systems the way they are. Sometimes the day, especially before big meetings, if you do everything the night before the deadline, the computers often crash. So, so get things done a week or two before the deadline and um, it will be better, okay? Uh, cast a wide net, okay? Basically, um, it would be really nice uh, if, like, I, I was always jealous of my brother and sister-in-law because they were lawyers and they could say, I want to live in Chicago and apply to the 10 firms in Chicago and, and get offers from six of them, right? I mean, you know, we, we don't have that luxury. We have a great life and everything's life, but, but, you know, our universities are located all over the place. And, you know, some people, you often end up living in a part of the world where you don't 
uh, think you're going to live. Like I spent five wonderful years in Arizona, but I had never been to Arizona before there. And, and I never thought about living in Arizona, but when I visited, it was a great place and I moved there and I loved it. Uh, but you know, but basically you want to have an open mind, uh, you know, some people never think they'll go to the private sector and then they have a fabulous career in the private. You just keep your, keep your options open. And if in, when in doubt, send to a school and you just don't know. I mean, and, um, you know, and if you start off by saying you want to live in Philadelphia or you want to live in Chicago, it's just really hard because there's only so much, even those are, those are very big uh, cities with lots of stuff going on. They have, you know, four or five universities in them and that's sort of it, right? And so those schools may not be looking, they may not be looking for someone like you, your interview might go back, you know, you can't count on anything on the job market, okay? And, um, and okay, don't ignore non-academic opportunities. I sort of, I said that already. And, and another thing is the final decision is yours. So often you feel like you want to impress your advisor and go to the highest ranked school and the advisor wants to, uh, and your advisor wants to talk to the dean and tell him how well, we placed so-and-so at, uh, at this university, uh, which is all true, but it's your decision. It's your life. And trust me, your advisor will, will forgive you if you, take, if you don't take the job that he wants you to take. Okay, but discuss it with them or her. But 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 yeah. But ultimately, it's your life, and you have to decide what you want to do with it. And um, and so that anyway. So that um, okay. So that's that's all I'm going to say about the job market uh, because you guys have heard too much about the job market right now. But but okay. So life as assistant professor. So one of the things that, again, when you have a doctor, when you're a doctoral student, you know, you think it's hard. But then what happens when you show up on camp? You know, you get you get a job. You, you, you fly to school, they, um, you know, you show up, you don't know your way around town, you don't know where to get your hair cut, you know, a doctor or a dentist. And then all of a sudden they say, okay, here are your three classes you're going to teach. And by the way, you're going to keep running research. And by the way, you're on four committees and, uh, and you're advising these students and, um, and what new papers are you working on and have, why haven't you published your dissertation yet? So, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it, there's, it, 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 it sort of all happens really quickly. Uh, and time passes really quickly. So it seems like, you know, the 10 year clocks are long. They're not, you know, six years is not a particularly long time. Uh, most of us think universities should ex manage to extend them, but changing any rules at any university is virtually impossible, especially at state universities. And, and so uh, time passes quickly. So time is your most valuable asset, okay? Uh, anything you can do that will save you time, um, you know, if you, if you can help get pay for childcare, you pay for RAs, pay for anything that will help you, it's worth doing it, right? So I have uh, some assistant professor friends I know that they, they hire people in India to do programming for them. And, you know, anything you can do that will save your time is good. I mean, and, you know, and it's especially, and it's life, it's a stressful time in your life. Um, you know, your papers get, most papers get rejected. Most, most published papers get rejected. Uh, I literally was talking to some, one of you before, beforehand who said she was telling me she cited a paper of mine and I, I told her that it was rejected three times before we finally, finally published it. She said, why? Well, I don't really remember. I just, the referee was in a bad mood the day that, uh, that I submitted it. I, I don't know, but, uh, but, but, you know, and, and so it's, you know, papers are rejected. Um, teaching ratings are low, right? I mean, one of the things that when you teach MBA students, you know, they show up, they pay a lot of money. They kind of like people with gray hair because we supposedly have wisdom or something. I don't know why, but, but, you know, but they, you know, and they, they give us, they give, you know, and you, you don't know the little tricks to get higher ratings. And if you show up and you get below average teaching ratings, you're, oh my God, this is terrible. You have always done well in everything in your whole life. And, you know, so sometimes colleagues are very nice when they interview, but when you, when you, you show up in campus, they're not so nice. Um, some people, you know, they, they think they'll like the town, they'll learn to like the town. They were taken to the one nice restaurant in that town when they were, were being recruited town, but then they discover that maybe they want to go to a different restaurant and, and uh, you know, and they decide that maybe this is, you know, so there's a lot of reasons why life can be, um, life can be stressful. And so you really want to push hard, you know, look at, take advantage of your time and, uh, and go there. So being an assistant professor, I always say you want to set goals, okay? So, so here are some very ambitious goals, uh, which you may, may, you may or may not receive, but at least set them, okay? And so try and submit your job market paper before you show up on campus, before you have to spend your life figuring out, um, 
you know, where, where, where you go shopping and where the doctors are and where, you know, and how to use the computer system in the new, you know, there's a million things. So get it in a journal before you get there, okay? Then, there, then most dissertations have, you know, a second or third essay. Try and really push to have those to a journal by the end of the first year, okay? And then the third goal is to start something new, okay? And, um, and, uh, and so I think that, uh, you know, starting something new, whether it be an extension of your paper, it may be with a grad school friend of yours. Uh, it's actually really great if you could have it be with uh, a, a, one of your new colleagues because it's nice to establish relationships with your new colleagues and you can fit in well and it's sort of, uh, and it's good. And the other thing is you want to teach well, okay? And, you know, we are paid, the reason we are paid is because the universities have these classes to teach and, and they want them taught well. Uh, but you you can be efficient about it, right? So you can um, get the slides from the person who taught it last year. Try and um, you know, al one thing that's a good idea is to allocate you know two days a week to teaching, and then do your class prep that night, and do your office hours uh, maybe the next morning or something like that. But whenever you are not sort of in the teaching part of your life, try and really go full fledged on on your research, because again, the time flies by and, um, and you know, it, it's just, it's, it's hard, right? Uh, and then um, you want to develop your relationship with your new colleagues, if you can to start a paper with one of them. Um, and the other thing people don't do is, the, a lot of professors don't hang out in the department enough. So in other words, when you show up, you know, be there, go to lunch, get to know everyone, figure out the politics, you know, the academic politics, and you know, and sometimes you have colleagues that have, uh, have real politics that you just don't agree with, which in which case don't bring it up and avoid avoid talking about it. But but you figure out the lay of the land of what's going on in your department um, and try and contribute, try and uh, help with recruiting. You know, read people's paper, pe people's papers, read the seminar papers. You know, it's you know I'm, I'm, it's one of the bad things about professions. People don't read papers enough. So especially you know on a in a Friday seminar, whatever you do, you know you should try and read the paper every week. Okay, at least read the introduction. And so many people don't do that. Um, you know, comment, read your colleagues' papers, give them comments, read the students' papers. The students are always desperate to have faculty read their papers. Read them when you're a professor. You know, it's not, it's not very hard. You just read the papers and say, you know, give them reactions because the, they, they appreciate it. So, I mean, this is the kind of stuff you can do as an assistant professor that really kind of makes your life better and makes everyone else's life better and makes them appreciate you more. Okay. Um, and so if you think about where well, you're an assistant professor, what are your career paths? Okay, so, uh, well, one, and there's basically three, right? You can get your promoted in your university and stay there the rest of your life. Okay, you can move to a different university or you can move outside the academic world, right? And, um, and what you want to do is you want to think about, and the truth is, no matter what you think when you take your first job, you don't know which of those options you're going to take, right? I mean, uh, we have this weird thing in Columbus where we have a lot of international faculty. And the truth is that most of them showed up in Columbus, Ohio, which is this little, it's not actually kind of a biggest city, but it's in the middle of the country. And, you know, quite frankly, people in other countries don't know much about it. And so they figure they take a job in Columbus for a couple of years and they move someplace uh, they like better. And then the weird thing about Columbus is people like it there and they stay for a, a long time. So there's a bunch of our senior faculty who are actually from other countries who never envisioned they would be in Columbus, Ohio for 30 years, but they, but they were. And, uh, and you know, in Illinois, it was the same thing, right? You know, people moved to Champaign and, and where I used to teach and, and people, oh my God, I'll be here for, for two years if there's not great restaurants and, you know, and, and then the next thing you know is they develop friendships and they write papers and they, and then they get promoted and then they're entrenched in the community. And then 30 years later, they're still there. Right. And that's just the way careers develop. Uh, you know, and some people think they're going to be at the job in the university and stay there for 30 years and then they hate it and they move or they get another, you just, so you don't know which of these bundles you're going to go into. Um, and, and so you want to develop human capital to have all three, right? And so, so I mean, I think the thing about it is that the human capital for getting promote, for moving to a different university is pretty much the same as moving to the same university. Uh, one thing that people don't realize is that how well you are as a colleague and how well you teach at your current university is essentially public information. So in other words, uh, 
if, if Michelle wanted to hire one of our uh, one of our professors away, uh, she, she might, you know, and she wants to know what the per before she made the offer, she might call me and say, look, what's this so and so really like? Is he in the office? Does he teach well? Does he create problems? And um, and I, I would tell her the truth. And so and that's just the way our business works. Again, you might not think that's fair. You might think, you need, but, but basically we, we all know each other. We all talk to each other. And so the, 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 all of the capital you develop will, um, will, um, will be, uh, <coughs> will, will be re relevant. Um, and moving outside academia, a lot depends on your skills and also your connections, right? So one of the things that uh, finance professors should do more of and don't, at least is most of them, is to develop connections outside the academic world, okay? Uh, and I, you know, I, I started doing private equity and one of the great things about private equity is this is a great network of practitioners that, that actually care about what we do research on. And the other thing is we care about what they say because every single year there's some new stuff going on in the industry and, and we find out from them. And so, so like in a, in a month, I'm going to go to a conference in North Carolina where basically I'm going to hear a bunch of papers, but really why I'm going is because I can talk with the practitioners and finding out, find out what, what's going on in the industry. And, uh, and, and, and I just kind of want to know that for my classes and also for, for my research. And you, know, you never know what, where it's going to lead. Um, but d developing academic, moving outside academia, I'm not really the right person to talk because I've been a, a nerdy professor my entire uh, entire career. But but there are a bunch of people uh, who, who have done that, and so like uh, sometimes you'll have uh, we have some colleagues who've spent time at hedge funds and at, uh, and, and so they they can be actually quite helpful in terms of uh, guiding uh, people in terms of what kind of capital develop. Um, okay. The season market for junior faculty. Okay, this is um, this is something that is always a great mystery to many junior faculty. What? How do people get offers, and why do people move, and everything? And so, uh, I always talk about. I mean, these are these are terms I didn't invent, but but I've, they're not why, completely accepted, but pretty widely accepted. There's the term rookie substitute. Basically, what that means is that um, if somebody's out a year or two. And let's say we, we have a position that we don't fill in the rookie market. We will often like look to people at other universities who we could then offer the same contract to that we would offer a rookie. And the deans don't care. It's the same amount of money. We would give them a new tenure clock. And they're basically a substitute for, uh, for a rookie. So if somebody goes to a place and just hates it in their first two years, they often can go to another place and have a... Um, essentially a new clock and basically uh, take over. Uh, now, once you've been out three or four years, the universities sometimes say, well, you, we can't call you a rookie anymore. Basically, what you will call you is like a, a seasoned assistant professor. And you, maybe you would have a shorter clock and maybe the salary would be a little bit higher, but sometimes not. Uh, and and, the, and the, the season market re relies much more so on connections than on uh, applications. So you kind of it would be kind of much more usual to hire somebody on the season market that somebody on your faculty actually knows than to hire uh, strange. And, um, and you should have, uh, and the thing about season people is they have a, a, a track record of research, teaching and service and, and all three are considered. So we would be extremely reluctant to hire somebody in the season market if their teaching was awful. And we just we would find that out, and we just we just wouldn't do it. Uh, even though we might love the research, we might love the person, but our deans would sort of go ballistic if we tried to hire somebody who's um, who, who just couldn't teach. And so so teaching is important. Um, and you know, and often at the se more seasoned market fit is a bigger deal. Uh, so we would might want to if we have a particular course we would want to teach or something that would be more of a factor in the seasoned market than in the um, in, in the rookie market. So, you know, like if we, if we, like we, we probably would like to hire people more in the investments area. So, so we kind of looking for, we might be looking at seasoned people in that area, uh, or you might be in versus in corporate or, or real estate or whatever. Um, um, now there's often, I would say implicit promises of tenure, but when you, the, I, I always think about it, when you hire somebody who's been out three or four years, they have a record. And if we don't like their papers, then we don't want to hire them. Because if, because basically, to me, when you hire somebody that far out of grad school, you're saying, well, I like your papers and I like you. And so in order, if you do more papers of that, that quality, then 
hopefully we'll be able to promote you, right? I mean, I think that if the market's working, I think that's kind of the, the implicit converse, maybe not said in those words, but that I would be very upset if our department hired somebody three or four years out, and then we decide, then some of my colleagues say, well, we hired him, but we decided we didn't like the work. And he said, well, we liked the work three years ago when you brought him to Columbia. So we, we wouldn't probably do that at Ohio State, but, but you know, um, people are people. Um, and um, okay, so how do you approach it? Well, when, you, when do you go on the season market? It's a, it's a little different than the rookie market. Because in the rookie market, you know, you're graduating. Everyone knows you're looking. And so you mail to everyone in the world and tell them you're looking. Whereas the season market... Uh, you might want to keep it a little more quiet because you know the first thing that will happen if you contact a school is the person who receives it will call her his friend at your school and say what's going on is this person why is this person unhappy and and so uh, how do you approach them it's a good idea to sort of uh, you know get um, you know get to know people and places like the FMA meetings are a good place to do it right where you actually get to know people and uh, then you often can have a senior person intermediate, you know, and often personal decisions are important. Like, so if you have five kids, you might want to go to a place where you can buy a really big house and it's, it's cheap, right? Uh, you know, I, I have a former student who was, was a single woman and she was like in a little town in the Midwest and this, her colleagues loved her. But then the idea of moving to a big cosmopolitan city uh, was like, wow, this is great, right? And she's in a little apartment now, but she's loving it there. And, um, and, and it just sort of, it, it, these personal factors matter a lot on the season market. I mean, her first job was a great job for her to get. She developed, wrote papers, she developed connections, but you know, that wasn't where she wanted to spend her life and she, it made sense for her to move and now she was just promoted to tenure and so she'll probably be in her current job for the rest of her life, but may, maybe not, I don't know. Uh, but um, but again, again so, the best, so the best outcome is if like the school contacts you or you kind of can arrange it as opposed to just sort of contacting them and mailing applications to them, uh, and that 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 works best. Although sometimes we get an application, and say, this person looks really good. Maybe we should have them through. But but normally it works better if it's a connection. Um, okay. So how do you improve your chances? Well, of course you publish papers. Uh, you want to become well known in an area. Do research people care about. Uh, go to conferences. Get to know people. Be a nice, easygoing person. You want to get along with everybody. Teach well. Uh, and the other thing is that. You want to teach courses that, that universities want to staff, okay? And right now, the courses in high demands are entrepreneurial finance, fintech, behavioral. I should have put real estate. Real estate's always in demand. So if you teach courses like that, your market will be better. I mean, it's just that, you know, um, the undergrads are all, the, the, the students want to take certain courses, right? And, um, and, you know, it's fine if you teach like corporate finance or investments well, but you're, 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 Cap, your, your, your attractiveness to schools will be higher if you teach stuff that they want to want to teach, want to have taught, right? I mean, it's just, it's, it's not complicated, but somehow people forget about this. Um, okay, promotions, okay. Uh, the next topic. So I, I, sorry, I'm going a little slow, but I'll, I have to, so, okay. So the three major reviews at all universities, there's the first one is called the assistant professor mid-career review, which is in the third or fourth year. The tenure, which is the biggest one, which is usually in the sixth year, but a lot of schools are pushing it back. The private schools tend to have longer clocks uh, than the public schools. Uh, and in other countries, it's a slightly different system, but it's, they're, they're tend to be moving towards the tenure thing that U.S. schools have. And then the full professor review is more flexible because, you, you know, once you're in a tenured associate professor, you know, you can stay that the rest of your life. But usually, usually you don't, don't want to go up for full professor unless... Your department wants you to go up for full professor because it's kind of bad for everyone if you you force them to consider you and they tell you no and then you get mad at them and they, it's just really awkward so it's much better to wait and sort of reach an agreement um and so the, the typical promotion process is you you turn you know again i'm just kind of going through this all you turn in your packet which contains a lot of stuff and we are at our university which is pretty typical you turn it in like the june before the year that you you go up um you send for outside letters, and what you do is you, you the candidate selects some, the, the department picks some. Um, usually, 
there, I think some schools do mid-career review letters, but most schools don't. And, and they have different, like some schools, some private schools have uh, associate, which is untenured, whereas most state schools don't have that. So there's slightly different, different systems, but basically it's pretty similar. Um, the departmental committee meets and votes, and then the committee writes a letter summarizing the meeting. Now, again, at some schools, the, there's no departmental committee and the whole college votes. It's, it's again, but this is more or less the way it works in most places. At OSU, the committee would write a, a letter, then the department head would write a letter, and then usually the the candidate will hear what happened at the departmental meeting, but sometimes not. Um, it depends on the custom of the department. Um, and then the college, there's usually a college committee that makes a recommendation, then the dean makes, makes a recommendation, and then the university committee, sometimes it's a university committee, sometimes, we, we actually don't have that one at Ohio State, but most schools do. Um, and then the, the provost makes the final decision, and normally the provost will approve what has been uh, have been decided, but sometimes these are hard calls for, you know, in 5% of the cases, the provost has to think hard because, you know, sometimes one committee said one thing and another committee said another thing, and there's accusations of who knows what, you know, and yes, Michelle? Hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. So, actually, one of the things I think what I think Michelle was about to say, and I know her well, is that people people don't spend any time on the research statement. So, in other words, when I I get asked to write more outside letters than I would like at this stage, and and so, you know, if I want to know what's in your papers, I'll read your papers, right? If I don't see the abstract of your paper, I have copies of it in front of me, right? What I want in, to see in a research statement is I want to know what you think of as your, your research, what, how you think about problems, right? I mean, every one of us is different and we all think about issues in a slightly different way. Ideally, what you want is you want the group of your papers to teach us more than the in collection of the individual papers. And you want the research statement to say what we learned from the group of papers. Is this what you were gonna say, Michelle? Yeah, and, and so that, and it's sort of, a waste of, again, what you want to do is you want to use every every space you have productively, and you're given this opportunity to write something like this, and so many people waste it by simply, you know, oh, one paragraph on this, one paragraph on this, and, and it's sort of like, uh, if I want to do that, I'll, I'll read the papers, right? And so, um, and so, again, what you want is to convince people that your papers collectively teach us something important, and then also that there's more to come, right? In other words, if you if you are the person that just, you know, is a nice guy who ends up being a co-author on random papers on random topics, that is not nearly as impressive as somebody who sets their own agenda and decides that I want to study this and this and this and this and this and, you know, in these aspects of the same problem. And then I've done that in my first five years as a professor. But moreover, I'm going to discover these other things about this issue in, in the next uh, 10 years of the professor. And that's the kind of person that we want to have on our, on our, uh, on our uh, departments. Okay. Um, and so, um, okay, outside letters. Uh, okay. Now the faculty in the, one of the things that is, is often misunderstood, I think, is that the truth is that the, your, your colleagues know what you're like. They know what the profession thinks of you. The real purpose of the outside letters is to convince the people in the other departments. So in other words, that there are people on the college committee from marketing and management, and they don't have any idea. Maybe they see you in the hallway, but they don't know uh, what your research is about. They don't know how, good you how well you teach. And so what they want to do is they want, they want to see a letter from somebody at the Kellogg School or from Harvard Business School or somebody like that, someplace like that, that says, oh, yes, yes, he's really good. This paper is excellent and all this stuff, right? So that, that's it's sort of that's the confirmation part of the letters that um, that is real, really important. And the provost as well. The provost has no idea who you are. But if the provost sees good letters from from people with fancy titles at good universities, that's kind of what uh, what matters. Um, and um, and so you you, you want to pick people from universities that they would recognize as, as top, or people who edit top journals or people have you know running a center in your area or something like that this is you know this is kind of the thing you want um now the other thing you have to remember is that senior people hate writing letters it's, it's awful uh, basically you get this request and can you evaluate so and so and should we promote so and so and it's like that's the last thing i want they don't even pay you 
right? When you do a referee report, they pay you $100 and, you know, and basically you're asked to read a paper and comment on the paper. When you're asked to write a, 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 a letter, you're commenting on this, per this nice person and their overall stature and whether they should be promoted at the university. And I don't know, I sort of feel like I, I should be getting my consulting rate when I do that because it's more, far more painful than any consulting you'll ever do, right? And, um, and it's, it's especially really painful if you don't know the work or if you don't think that highly of the work. And so, so I, you know, if there's a, if there's somebody who I think is, uh, is wonderful, then I say, oh yeah, okay, I'll write about it. And, and usually if I think he's wonderful, I know his papers anyway. And, uh, and so I kind of write, it doesn't take that long to write the letter, but if somebody who has papers, I don't know, or some papers of marginal case, I, I, I would, uh, try and come up with a reason not, not to do it. Uh, you know, it's, it's, I mean, I'm, I mean, I, I'll do it, but you know, it's just, and, and so often, um, and the other thing is they don't even tell you the outcome sometimes. It's like you write, you spend a week writing this letter and then it goes to the university and they, they send you, thank you for doing, doing such a good job, but they don't actually tell you whether the person got promoted or not. Uh, and it's, it's, it's it, and they don't, they don't send a thank you gift even. It, it just, it just, it's, it's one of my personal things, right? I've been trying to get our, and our department's terrible. I've been trying to get us to send little gifts. Some departments do that, by the way. Like Davis sends some olive oil, which is really, really nice. And so, uh, so no, but it's, it's, it, it matters. But it, so you only want to write letters if you're positive about the case. And, um, and, and the other thing is sometimes candidates find out about the letters, right? So there's state schools have these FOIA requirements where they can literally see their letters. But, you know, it's not just that. You know, sometimes, uh, I mean, our staff are excellent. We would never, they would, they would preserve confidentiality. You don't know who the staff are at the universities you're writing to. You don't know if the person going up has a good friend on the committee who will tell you that so-and-so wrote a bad letter and therefore that's what killed your case. I mean, you know, and so there's basically no upside to writing a bad letter. And so most people don't want to do it. And I'm, I'm just telling you what it looks like from the outside letter writer's perspective, right? And so, uh, so that, you know, you, most outside letter writers will write positive letters, but they will try not to write negative letters. And so I just, that's, you know, you may think that's terrible and unfair, but it's just, it's the truth. And if the, if the review doesn't go well, you do a global search, you cast a wide net. And it's, another thing that's important is if it doesn't go well, you may be furious with your colleagues. You may be mad at them for a dozen reasons. Um, and it's really important to keep good relations with them. I mean, the truth is that most of the time when people get promoted, it's not because they hate the person going up, it's because they think the work is deficient in some way or the teaching isn't good, but that the person is basically a nice person who will have a good career. And, and that, that when they apply for jobs, they will get phone calls from the schools that are considering them. And if this is you, you want your colleagues to say good things, right? I mean, you know, they also will call their friends at other universities and help you get a job if you have a good, so I think it's, it's actually qu can be quite difficult to sort of keep good relationships with your colleagues when things don't go well, but it's, it's actually quite important to do that. Um, you know, we had a, I won't, I, mean, I, I heard a story about a guy who didn't get promoted and he was so mad at his colleagues, he refused to let them know he was looking. And then of course he ended up with a far worse job than he would have had his colleagues been willing to and who, which they were perfectly willing to do. They were perfectly willing to, they, they liked the person, they just didn't think he met the standards. Um, and, um, and so anyway, um, okay. So keeping, the last topic is keeping life uh, interesting after tenure. Most people get tenure when they're around 40, maybe a little younger, a little older. Um, and so what do you do with the rest of your life, okay? And this is actually a harder question than it sounds, okay? Um, in the U.S., we don't have mandatory retirement. Um, in, in Asian schools, I think they mostly do. I'm not sure about European schools. Uh, you know, so basically, you can be a senior faculty for a really long time, right? And teaching, as much as you may like teaching corporate finance, it gets boring after 10 or 20 years, right? Uh, you know, uh, you can, the dividend discount model is only so interesting uh, to explain. You know, so that you, know, you want to do stuff with your life. Uh, you want to, uh, teaching doesn't take that much time, even though people say it does. Um, and what do you do all day long, right? And so many faculty, it's a pri it is the greatest job and many faculty end up bitter. And, you know, in typical, they, they publish some papers and then they, they kind of, and when they get 
tenure, they, they kind of publish the same, try and publish the same paper over and over again, or, or very, when I say the same paper, I mean similar papers. And then what happens is that, oh, well, the journals aren't as excited to see the small extension of the paper as they were as the original paper. So they don't, it's harder to get in. And some people stop getting paper, get, getting accepted. And then they could decide the profession's gone crazy and doesn't like my work anymore. And this is awful. And then the department chair, and then there's a fight with the, Believe me, we're always fighting with each other. So the department chair fights with the dean and the, the candidate. And anyway, uh, he complains to everyone. And once you complain to everyone about, about department chairs, department chairs always hear that. And then they, they don't, they're not very happy with you. And then I mean, the problem is when this happens when you're 45, you've got like 25 more years on the faculty and dealing with these people. And so it's, it's just not a good, uh, a good situation. And so I think you end up much happier if you find something that is useful to do in the, in the school, right? And so if you think about being a colleague as a part of your job, even again, even if you're really annoyed with some people in your department, still being a good colleague is part of your job. And so... Uh, and, and there's lots of stuff that needs to be done in every university that doesn't get done. I, mean, I would say student clubs, um, read colleagues' papers, make useful suggestions, helping students with their work and their placements, uh, being flexible uh, to teach courses that they don't want to teach, um, and also interacting with the business community. That's, again, it's one of the weird things. Like, you know, we're in Columbus, Ohio, we have all these companies, and it's like, well, they don't know anyone on the business school faculty, and that's sort of sad, right? I mean, and, that's, and this isn't just our department. This is every department, right? And it just we just we kind of are much more worried about what's going on at the JF than and, and who's editing it than actually what's going on in the company down the street. And you know, we ought to be worried about both. And I think that um, as you as you get to be a senior faculty member, especially interacting is important. Tom, and and the other thing is that being a one of the things people don't realize is that actually doing your job well is a lot more fun than doing it badly. And so, so you, you know, the typical we think of agency models where you're shirking and you get utility, but no, it doesn't work that way. When you, when you do your job well, you actually enjoy it much more. Uh, and, and the people and your colleagues appreciate it and reward you as well. So, uh, so, so what you, so I think the same principles uh, are applicable later in your career as applicable early in the career. So you think about new directions, right? So it may be you're interested in doing more research. It may be that you're not interested in doing research, but you want to learn about a new, you know, fintechs or something cool that's going on in the financial world and interact with the business community and consult. And, you know, and this is perfectly good, right? You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you know, pe some people love administration. Some people hate administration. I'm, that's me. Um, and some people, uh, you know, people write textbooks, right? Uh, People develop new courses. Department has love when you develop new courses, and uh, and you know, and often the, the new course you develop will be a lot more fun and rewarding in many ways than the you know the standard go through uh, dividend discount model in, in, in corporate finance, right? Um, you know, some people start consulting. Some people write uh, op eds and become a public intellectual. Some people. Um, you know, join the board of the FMA. Some people write, you know, me, I wrote a book on how to be an academic, right? So you do, there's lots of things you can do with your life, but they re all require investment. They just don't happen. Um, ha people think that, oh, I'm going to write a textbook someday, but until you sit down at the computer and start writing, it will never happen, right? And so you have to actually take the directions to, to do it. And so um, anyway, so that uh, that's my finish. You're the CEO of your life thing. I like that picture of my uh, my daughter did it for me, so I have to put it up twice. So anyway, so uh, I finished. I tried to finish in an hour, but it's an hour and a uh, few minutes. But we still have 20 minutes or so before the time is over. So and I, uh, so I, I uh, questions. So yes, um, what's your name? Christina. Yes. Can you talk louder? It's really hard to hear. So I have a question about. Balancing intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Balancing, extrinsic, balancing what? Intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Uh -huh. So you said that in earlier in your career, you um you kind of later on in your career you were able to get that intrinsic motivation from teaching and doing research. While from for example for me, um while I'm earlier in my career, I can find like mostly intrinsic motivation because I still don't have like the rewards that come with an academic. Well, I think in, intrinsic motivation is, is definitely the most important thing. Yeah. So in other words, if um, when people 
there's some doctor, for example, there's some doctoral students who who are like I don't know don't know what to do with their life, so they enter a doctoral program and then and then it's like oh my god I have to write a dissertation. What do I write it about? Okay, those dissertations won't come out nearly as 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 good as when somebody says I really want to do research on this aspect of private equity and I really it you know and it's not like I want to impress my advisors because I want to learn something about the world and the intrins that's what you would call intrinsic intrinsic and I think those you know, and the most successful academics are without a doubt intrinsically motivated, okay? And it's just, um, and, and absolutely, absolutely. Did I answer your question? Okay. Yes, so what's your name? Alex. Alex? Yes. Um, when you spoke about the transition of the season junior. Yes. Um, I was interested a little more in that. So I, me and actually other friends of mine who graduated, you know, you get positions at a school that is maybe not the level that you should be at, right? So your research uh -huh. surpasses what that school requires. Uh -huh. So now we're, say, two or three years into that. So what is that record? So you said you have to do it kind of differently from the working market. Well, I mean, you have to become be known for your research, I think, right? And yeah. you have to get people at the schools you are interested in to know who you are, right? And convince, you, convince them that you're good and that they would, you would be an excellent addition to their faculty. It's harder than tennis because you know they have to want you, but not just them. They, their department head has to want you, and they have their position. And um, but you know it certainly can be done. But you. Well, I mean you can, I suppose, but it's really. Um, you know, Chicago wants to hire you. They're going to hire you. Okay. They'll, they, then before they hire you, they're going to like know who you are, and um, and so mailing a packet doesn't really do any good. I mean, certainly, um, I think it's much. You know, you can mail your packet if you want. Now, you, you your colleagues will find out about it, and they might not be happy about it, right? Again, when you hire people, again, what you want to do when you know is you want to hire people who are happy at your place and who will be like we want to hire people. At Ohio State, who will hopefully end up living in Columbus for 30 years and being productive members on our faculty for a long time. And that's the goal. And so the last thing we want to do is to hire somebody who wants to leave as soon as they get there, right? And so, so to be honest, we would not be so excited if we heard that our colleague was sending out his resume. Then we would probably go talk, wait, well, why are you sending out your resume? And it's like, well, well, if MIT can hire me, and well, if MIT can hire you, then you should go to MIT. But, you know, on the other hand, if MIT is going to hire one of our professors, then they're going to know their, their work and, um, and, uh, and, and, and they'll, they'll approach them. And, and emailing, mailing, mailing to Antoinette Shore and saying MIT should hire me is probably not going to do much. Okay. And, did I answer a question? Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, oh, sorry. Actually, as for the discussion, because I, I think I hear from a little bit different perspective of what you, your understanding of the perspective of the last day is higher. As a main market, possession is much lower than most parts. And uh, that market works very different. And that actually leads uh, students uh, who are in that lower part of the market in very much happy. Which well, I think is true at every day. You know, I, I hate to use higher and lower now. There's, a, there's lots of excellent university out there. Um, I think that the people who hire at the SMA meetings, they want the same things we do. They want to hire faculty who are going to be happy and productive and be useful members of the faculty for, for a long time. And if they find out that you're unhappy or you're looking to move as soon as you show up, well, that's a bit of a problem, I think, right? On the other hand, if you, if, if you go into a clearly uh, Better research environment, and you're applying there. That's that's perfectly understandable, right? But um, but you have you better have a really good record to do that, okay? And you would likely know people in the school. Yeah. If you move to the say regional school level, uh -huh. they don't necessarily know everybody on that level. Well, that's right. They, you know, Look, we, we, if we got an application from somebody and like, wow, the, paper has, the person has four publications in the first three years and the papers look really good, we'll look at them, sure, sure, absolutely.
But usually what would happen is we would know about the person before we got the application in the mail. That's all I'm saying, yeah. Right, I mean, if, it, if, like if, it, if the person was working in private equity, for example, and they published four really good papers, I, I would know them. I would know the, oh, I would know the papers, yeah. So uh, that's all I'm saying. On the other hand, if it was like we were trying to hire somebody in fixed income, and I don't do fixed income, and there was somebody who wrote a bunch of papers really good that look really good at fixing, maybe that would that would uh, cross our our paths. Right? I mean, we have other colleagues that do fixed income, you know, but but still, I mean. Um, Let's say a slightly lower institution where teaching is maybe a little more important. If your research could be outpacing their requirements, then is it really a negative stigma when you're out in the market? Because they know you're doing more than you're um, doing. A little bit. Not negative, but it's more like, okay, we want to know what's going on. We want to kind of like, obviously, if somebody's a superstar, we can only keep them for a few years. That's that's life, right? Um, you know, when we had Mike Schwert on our faculty for two or three great years, and then he moved to Wharton, and he's publishing all these papers, and you know, probably he'll get promoted at Wharton, but maybe he won't. I don't know. And uh, and you know, and that that's fine, right? But Wharton called him. He didn't call Wharton when he moved there. Okay. Um, um, yeah. Next, there was a question over there. Yes. What's your What's your name? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I would like to ask you, uh, can you please share your thoughts on uh, publishing in top ranking journals versus not as high ranking journals, how it may um, improve or some kind of harm uh, our academic career? Well, I mean, obviously, we all want to publish in the, in the top journals, right? And um, I, I have always been of the view that if, if there's a paper that you really think is good and important, and it doesn't get into a top journal, you should publish it in, in another journal, okay? Um, and I would say that, that there, and one of the things that about our profession right now is there are a lot of very good journals that are e edited by absolutely excellent people who will give you great service that are not in the top three. Okay? And that um, and that I, you know, I could start listing them, but I'm sure I, if I list five, I would, I would forget 10 of them. So I'm not gonna say the names of the journals, but you know what I'm talking about and that, and that if, if you publish a paper in one of those journals, that's great. Um, you know, it's always more prestigious to publish in the very top journals, and those papers tend to get cited more, and they tend to get higher weight in promotion decisions. But if you have a paper that is a good paper, I think it would be terrible to say, oh, I didn't get in one of the top three journals, I'm gonna throw it away and work on something new. I, I, other people actually think that, right? I, I think that's wrong. Um, I think you should publish, and I think that, one of the things we're fortunate as a profession now is that there's really very good people editing all the journals and not just the top three. And so that, um, and, and that those very good people would be very, I mean, Alex Edmonds just gave the keynote, right? He's a, I don't know if you heard him, he's a terrific guy. He's editor of Review of Finance, which is a, not in the top three, but you know, it's a great journal. And so if you could publish something, and Alex will give you great service and you know, and he'll do that, so. Um, okay, yes, what's your name? I'm sorry? Maimuna. Maimuna? Uh, it's Maimuna. Maimuna, I'm sorry. No problem. So I have a question. So in a typical four-year PhD program, what happens is you usually have your comprehensive exam at the second year. And then within one year, if you want to go to the job market, maybe it's like at the end of the third year or at the beginning of the fourth year. So in that case... Four years, you know, usually, I mean, I think five years, we, we, oh, we call ourselves a five-year program, but some students are taking longer. Oh. And four years now is very unusual. Uh, okay, so yeah, so I know, I know some schools uh, who offer four-year PhD programs for finance, for example. So what my question is, sometimes like when you go to the job market, maybe at the very beginning of the fourth year, so at that moment, you may have just started uh, your dissertation, uh, like, you started writing your dissertation. No, no, no. When you go in the job market, you have to have a finished paper. Yeah. So, okay. so that's like that's that was my question. It's like when it's a four-year program. So, for instance, U.S. business schools. So, how what's your expectations for students when they have to go have to go to the job market when they are just at the very beginning of the fourth year? I mean, the rule to go in the job market is you have to have a paper and it's got to yeah. be published. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, it just won't work if you don't have a college paper. And um, 
And in terms of time, again, what we try to do in our program, and I, I spend some time visiting Minnesota, so I see Kira's here. I, I think it's similar. We, we, we try and have students have their polished paper by their fifth year. Sometimes they take to the sixth year. And so, um, so, um, so, so, but, but it, it would be, I mean, look, when I was a student, four year was, a, was a normal and I kind of wrote my dissertation and I, I, uh, my, my JFE 88 paper that gets cited a lot is, was actually, I wrote that in the summer of my, after my third year and in the fourth year I went on the market with that paper, but, you know, but I think that I can't quite figure out why, but students don't do that anymore. It's students usually take a fifth or sixth year before they have a polished paper. So, um, which it didn't used to be the norm. And the norm it used to be, oh yeah, you finish in four years, so you write your dissertation, your job market paper in your third year, and you go on the market in the fourth year. But, but that's not as common as it used to be. That that would be very rare today. Okay. So, um, but yeah, as 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 a school looking to hire, we would, you know, when we get the packet in the mail, we would like read the job market paper, and it has to look like it's, you know, very polished and almost ready to submit to a journal. Yeah, we, we, we would not interview somebody who did not have a paper that we thought looked very good. Which may not be my dissertation. Well, why would it be your dissertation? I mean, we would, we, would, we would focus mostly on the job market paper. And one of the things about the job market paper is that it's supposed to be sole author. If it was not sole author, there better be a good reason why it's not. So, for example, there was a former student who basically had access to this really uh, great private data, but his, and to his co his, he had a co-author whose name was solely on the paper because he provided the data, and that was okay. Um, but but you know we would look down on a student who has who's especially if it's co-authored with her advisor. Okay. Um, sometimes you have students that are uh, have co-authored papers on the job market, and you know um, the most famous is Rob Vishney who. Every single one of his papers was co-authored, but he still got tenure at Chicago three or four years out of grad school. So, so because there he had so, the papers were so good, and you know, and and but but you know, I mean, I, you know, the thing about Rob is he could have written the brilliant sole of the papers he chose to not to, and uh, and but most people on the job market, I mean, you know, ninety nine point nine percent of the people, they have a job market paper. It's sole authored, and that is by far the thing that gets the most attention from the recruiting committee. We like it when there's other papers, but again, the job market paper is, uh, you know, I, and I have some students here and they'll, they'll tell you, I always tell, tell the students that, you know, you know, forget it, you know, it's great that you have co-authored papers, but 90% of your effort should be on your job market paper because that is really what matters. Uh, and that's what people look at. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you may say they shouldn't, but that's just the way it is. Here. Yeah. I have a related question. So we yeah. talk about research statements for assistant professor getting yeah. promoted. Yeah. Now for John Marshall ten years, what's your same thing? Same thing. Same thing. Yeah. Yeah. No. Talk about. I mean, I always like it where I I became interested in the topic because of X, and I'm interested in these kinds of questions, and I done this paper that addresses the first one, and I'm really looking forward to, you know, my research over the next five years would, would kind of address these following related. I, I would love that as a research statement. It's much better than just the abstracts of your, your papers. Um, and, and it was funny because Michelle asked the question, you know, right when I was about to say it, right? And we did not plan that, okay? So, so yeah, so, uh, yeah. Over, uh, yes, uh, another question, yeah. No, no, it's fine, go, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Is it better to do that move when you know as a specific Yes, yes, yes. It's easier to move without tenure. Okay. So it's definitely easier to move without tenure. So if you know you want to be in California, right? And you're in Ohio, then you're easier to get a job at a California school because basically the school doesn't have to it, it's a lot harder to get a, a tenured position. So like mo, mo, like our department is getting older and so 
we, we, we actually hopefully will be able to make a tenured offer this year to somebody. But, um, but most years we just look and we're just looking at junior, junior faculty and, um, and may, we might be able to consider somebody three or four years out for a senior junior position. But most years we, we, are, we simply couldn't hire somebody with tenure because the dean's office is like hire younger, right? Um, and so it's easier to move, it's definitely easier to move and it makes sense, right? Because when they offer you tenure, they're they're giving you a lifetime contract, and so therefore, um, if they made a mistake, then they're stuck with it. Whereas if they, you know, and, and so, so it's a lot easier to convince a school to give you a untenured position than a tenured position. Yes. 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 Is it? How? Any question? Uh, yes, I'm from Utah. Yeah. University of where? Utah. Utah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They have a what? A postdoc. Yeah, postdocs are becoming more common, but they're still not common in our field. I think that um, you know, those people in those fields are very jealous of us and that they don't have to do postdocs. People, if you talk to somebody in biology, oh my God, it's like they do three postdocs before they can apply for a faculty position. And they're, they're, they, when they hear that finance professors are getting jobs you know, right out of grad school, and at the salaries they get it, they're like, oh my God, why can't go in biology, right? And so, uh, so, so yeah, so it's, uh, but, but we're starting to have more postdocs and, um, no, no. Yes. Well, the way postdocs seem to work, like in our department, we sometimes have, uh, have people who come and visit for a couple years. Like you mentioned, your colleague was visiting at uh, at Ohio at our department for a couple of years, and then she got a job at, at in Nebraska, right? And so, I'd like to think that her experience at Ohio State helped her get 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 the capital that got her the job. But maybe it, maybe she could have gotten there without it. But I don't I don't know. But I think that um that's kind of the way that works. I mean, so that they 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 normally involve teaching. And now there's a few postdocs. I mean, the NBER has some very prestigious postdocs, but they're often for like people who've gotten jobs at Wharton already, and then they can spend the year at, uh, at NBER. So, so, but yeah, so it's a good way that the RFS has a thing where they hire a postdoc to help with the editorial process. Um, so they do exist, but it's not the norm in our profession. And, and we like it that way, right? We like it that, yeah, that it's not the norm. But, um, other questions? Yes. I'm probably the wrong person to ask about those jobs since I've never actually um, applied for one myself. Um, I actually have another student, not not Hake, but her friend who's who's applied recently, and um, and so that um, you know, I think that those jobs require a lot of skills. You know, one of the things that they asked at the interview was to solve a really a hard Python programming problem, and there was some, you know, and they. Um, you know, they, they want skills that will help you develop alpha. And so the extent, the extent that you do as a system professor, that's great, right? I mean, um, you know, if you write papers about the theory of capital structure, the hedge fund is not going to find you more attractive, right? I mean, uh, they want skills that will help them uh, earn alpha. And so again, I, I, I'm the wrong person to ask. I would ask somebody who has, who's connected in the investment management world about that. But I mean, that's my impression, yeah. Other other questions? Um, well, um, that, that I guess what time is it? It's uh, exactly one o'clock. So perfect. So. Yeah.